Well, we're moving toward a very climactic healing service tonight. Not merely a physical healing, but a time when all of us accept our healing and transmit healing one to another. Uh, sometimes we are not healed because we never come to a fixed place of faith in terms of time space. We know God heals. That's a great big general truth. But we need somewhere where we say, He heals me right here, right now. And so that's what tonight will be about. And if Jesus wants to do it before then, he has my permission. <laughs> but uh, let's uh, be sensitive today and be giving ourselves. And I trust in the healing service, though there may be certain ones laying out of hands, that every person here will be very much involved in this healing service tonight. For whatever you want and need for yourself, you'll get by willing for others and giving to others. For whatever you give in the name of Jesus comes back, pressed down, shaken together, running over. So we're healed by healing. We're saved by saving. We're forgiven by forgiving. We're loved by loving. We are served by serving. We, are, we live by giving life. Whatever you want, start giving it. <laughs> In the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, yeah, I didn't mean to get at all that. <laughs> but it's wonderful to see uh, something of what it is uh, as children of God together, members of his body. And there is healing breaking out everywhere. I've seen more healings take place this year, this calendar year, than any time in my life. If any of you from uh, over in the other side of the hills, around Washington, Oregon, uh, Northern California, well, it's not far from here, just have to go through Montana. <laughs> There'll be a group of us over in Salem, Oregon in a few weeks, 24th of June, 24th to 28th. The Order of St. Luke, the physician, is having their Pacific Northwest Healing Conference. And Canon Jim Glennon, Canon Jim Glennon from Australia, longtime wonderful friend. This uh, diocese of Sydney is very evangelical. They do soul winning. Would you believe it? Who ever heard of an Episcopalian? Knocking on doors, saying, how is it with your soul, brother? <laughs> but they do that in Sydney. And they have between uh, three and five hundred just about every Wednesday night at the cathedral for their healing service. Canon Glennon will be over with us. Uh, Father David Garretts, who uh, has just uh, been used for miracles down in Pecos, uh, New Mexico, uh, he'll be with us. and They've even going to let me do some uh, speaking and preaching and praying. So be, be with us in spirit if you're not, can't get there in person. But the reason I said that, if you know of anyone who needs healing and needs to get involved in that, and they're in that area, drop them a note. Tell them to come to uh, Willamette College. Did you say Willamette? Is, yeah, I think. It's, you're, yeah, you're, that's, Willamette is the right pronunciation in it. Looks like it ought to be Willamette. <laughs> but Willamette College in Salem, and we'll have the evening services, well, on one night in the First United Methodist, one night in St. John's, and one night in St. Joseph. <laughs> so uh, we're going to have all kinds of good stuff. Well, thank you. I want to read again a scripture that I read the other morning and maybe say what I was going to say. 
But the Lord can rearrange that if he wants to. Hey, you two just came in, didn't you? Thank you. Who are you? Great to see you, Jim and Brenda. Welcome. Anybody else just come in? Hallelujah. You look like you've been here all the while. Your light's shining. <laughs> uh, it's great to see you. In the 14th chapter of Jonah's gospel, <laughs> of John's gospel, uh, the wonderful part of the last night discourse, beginning with verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even a spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, or as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. Often people ask me, how can I know when I have the Holy Spirit? John 14, 20. In that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and I in him, and ye in me, and I in you. Do you know you're in Jesus? And do you know he's in you? And do you know he's in the Father? That's what the Holy Ghost is all about. Not just goosebumps on goosebumps. <laughs> though that might be included. And not merely gifts, though that might be included. And uh, not just anointings, though that ought to be included. In that day ye shall know that I am in my Father and ye in me, and I in you. For we live and move and have our being in him. Uh, we're in the world, but the world's not in us. <laughs> you know, the kingdom of God is in us. Uh, yeah, really, sin doesn't die to us. We die to it. Uh, by learning to live to the new in the new life that is ours, in Jesus Christ. Jesus is our life. He's not merely a life giver. In the first epistle, John tells us that this is life eternal. Now, well, well, let me repeat, uh, let me give you the whole scripture. For this is the witness that God has given unto us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. And he that hath the Son of God hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. Now that's pretty plain, isn't it? He that hath Jesus hath life. He that hath not Jesus may be a pretty decent fellow, pretty decent woman, may be a, even a Democrat. <laughs> may be a U.S. citizen. May be a United Methodist even. But he has not life. If you don't have Jesus, you don't have it. Now, that's the scripture. If I were going to write the scripture, I wouldn't be that bold. I'd stop with the first part of it if I was writing it. I'd say, he that hath the Son of God hath life. And just let you wonder about those that don't have Jesus. But the Bible is much more definite than that. Jesus is not only life giver, he's life. He's not only healer, he's health. He's not only guide, he's guidance. He's not only wealth giver, he's wealth. Jesus is our all. And it's wonderful to know that he's both principle and person. 
And as we come to, uh, into union with Jesus, and that's what life is all about, Jesus living in you, and you living in Jesus, that's the new order. That's the purpose of the Holy Spirit being given. You see, the Christian dimension of the Holy Spirit it has, is different than the pre-Christian. The Holy Spirit is one with the Father. It's not a different Holy Ghost that we receive as Christians than the one by whom God breathed into the nostrils of Adam. Same breath of God, same Holy Ghost that anointed Elijah and filled John from his mother's womb. Same one. But his ministry has changed. The emphasis of the Holy Spirit has been changed since the resurrection and the ascension. The primary mission of the Holy Ghost since the resurrection and the ascension is to bring us into union with Jesus Christ, the new humanity, not from the realm of where he once was, but from the realm of where he now is. Amen. Glory to God. And I'd rather be with him a minute where he now is than a hundred years where he once was. As wonderful as the Bible is, it's not going back to the book and trying to reproduce the book. The Bible teaches against worshiping the Bible. It's not an idolatry. This Bible points you to the face of Jesus. Jesus Christ stood standing in the synagogue, read the Bible, and said, it pertains to me. This day is the scripture fulfilled in your hearing. On the Emmaus Road, Jesus spoke to the two and said, O oh, fools and slow of hearts to believe all that the prophets have told you. And opened the book to Moses, began to teach them how it was that Christ should have come and should have been crucified and dead and buried and raised again. The book is given for the purpose of bringing us into union with Jesus. Glory to God. It's not an institution, as wonderful as the institution is. The institution is the means of the sacramental expression of God. But it's not an institution. It's Jesus himself. He's the Lord of the church. The church doesn't offer itself as our Savior. The church exists to reveal the life of its Lord. Glory to God. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And coming into the realm of union in the power of the Spirit is to know the Lord Jesus Christ in the one place that is really relevant. And that's on the inside of you. You see, it's not enough to be with him where he once was. It's not enough to have visions of him. He said to those who had seen him, who had walked with him for three years, who had learned to pray with him, who had learned to cast out devils with him, who had learned to preach, who had learned to believe and know that he was the Messiah, he said to them on the level of external relationships, it's expedient for you that I go away. Oh, I used to re hear that song. I, I, you know, how does it go? Uh, I think when I read the sweet story of old, when Jesus was here among men, how he called little children as lambs to his fold, I wish I could have been with him then. And I used to read the gospel, and I'd think, Lord, if I could have just been with you that day when you multiplied the loaves and fish, if I'd seen the look on the little boy's face, had seen those doubting disciples with 12 basketfuls left over, man, wouldn't you love to have been there? Wouldn't you really have believed? No, no more than you would right now. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, no external sign, no external sign will transform human nature. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. Not by, my, not by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord. And do you know, we have the unusual and rare privilege of a dimension of union that those in the Bible never knew. Isn't that wonderful? We have the wonderful privilege of knowing him directly, nearer than hands or feet, nearer than the breath that we breathe. It's wonderful. We are living it out right here and right now. Sometimes I meet friends who are trying to establish the New Testament church. You ever hear that? Oh, we got New Testament church. Let me tell you something about New Testament church. New Testament church didn't have the New Testament. 
It wrote the New Testament. It didn't have it. We are standing in place of high privilege. We're standing on the fruition of those apostles and disciples, those brothers and sisters who paid the price to bring us to where we are. God forbid that we should act pre-Christian or pre-resurrection in our concepts. He's alive. He's with us now, right here within, saying, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. So coming into union with Jesus. Now, most of us here this morning are rejoicing to know that this is your experience and it's your walk. But coming into union with him, with him is just the beginning stages. It then becomes an unfolding way of life. I in you and you in me. And where Jesus gives himself to us in such a way that he loses his life in us. It's wonderful. You see, I used to think somehow when the Holy Spirit really got a hold of me, it would be all of him and none of me. And I'd hear people say, if I could just get myself off my hands. <laughs> you lazy thing. You unbelieving thing. You proud thing. To want to get anything as wonderful as you off your hands. You're not your own. Yeah, if you made yourself, wouldn't be much to you. <laughs> but you're not your own. You're his. You're made by him. You're made for him. You're held together in him. It's wonderful to know that it's not all of him and none of you. It's all of him and all of you. And so when Jesus, by the Spirit, comes to live within us, he comes in different ways. One way he comes is like a seed. He's the first fruit of those who come after him. I, I don't have to do it. I want to tell you this little story. Uh, I hear again with my granddaddy. I told you about the corn the other day. Let me tell you about watermelons. Anybody here doesn't love, love watermelons? Well, you ought to live in the South. You'd fall in love with watermelons. Uh, if you've never, never seen a package of watermelon seed, you owe it to yourself. It's the most beautiful photography in the world. And I went with my granddaddy to buy watermelon seed. And I'd look over these packages, you know, and they'd have a great big green stripy watermelon on one side. On the other side, they'd have a cross section of the melon cut with red meat, white and green rind, black eyes popping out at you. And I'd say, Granddaddy, let's get this one. Granddaddy, let's get this one. Now, he made me think I was getting everything I wanted. I know now, looking back on it, that he had a way of letting me think I was guiding him. Jesus has that way. <laughs> surprise, surprise. But anyway, we bought, the, we bought this pie, the, these watermelon seed, put them in a bag, and I held the bag. I tell you, going all the way, riding with my granddaddy, holding that bag. And every once in a while, I'd reach in and pick out a package, you see. And I knew in that package were little, miniature watermelons. I knew that, you know. I saw the picture on the, on the package. And I could hardly wait to get out in the field and, you know, see these little watermelons and plant them. So Granddaddy let me open the package. Well, be careful, Tom. So I held that package up, you know, and I opened it. And I held it, and I waited for those little watermelons to roll out. And there came sliding out of that package, old dried up seed. <laughs> Ugliest thing in the world almost is a dried up watermelon seed. It's amazing. And I looked at those seeds, I cried. I felt like God, my granddaddy, nature, and everything else had played a trick on me. Now, my granddaddy didn't say, Tom, now let me tell you a great spiritual truth. You know, it's wonderful, isn't it, when you can express supernatural things very naturally. 
in Jesus, the supernatural is expressed naturally, and the natural is lifted to the supernatural. That's the way it is in Jesus. Uh, you can see all these gifts of the Spirit all the time in the Gospels. And he never stops at the woman at the well and says, Now, that was the gift of discernment <laughs> of spirits. Now, let me give you an example of the gift of wisdom, word of wisdom. No, Jesus uses these gifts all the time and flows so freely, so naturally. It's wonderful, isn't it? And now, understand, if we, all of us are, you know, are adolescent enough to get more excited about the gift than we are the giver, then hallelujah. <laughs> you know, it's wonderful. There's a time for that. Let me see your hand, sister. Yeah, left it. hold it right up where everybody can see it. You know. Look at that. Now, there's been a time when that precious lady coming to people like us would have had that left hand all over her face. She, I bet she went to work one day or went home one day and said, oh, look, oh, look, oh, look. <laughs> you know, boy, I mean, she was gift-oriented. She, she said she at college she ate sandwiches with her left hand. <laughs> I mean, how good can it get? <laughs> See, now that's gift-oriented. Now, if she had rejected the gift, when Doug came and said, look, darling, would you let me slip it on your finger? Suppose she would have said, Doug, I don't believe so. To reject the gift would have been reject the giver. Why should I have to speak in tongues? Or why should I have to prophesy? Or why should I have to get into healing ministry? You don't have to do anything. You can stay like you are. <laughs> Is that what you want? Why shouldn't we have the privilege of good and perfect gifts? Amen. Who are we to think that God gives anything less than good gifts and perfect gifts? Amen. And we receive the gifts. Lord, lay it on. <laughs> a ring on my fingers, shoes on my feet, a robe around my shoulders. Lay it on. Where's the fatty calf? <laughs> <laughs> But there comes a time, you see, when she gets so much in union with the giver that the ring is still wonderful. She's not ring conscious. She wears it very naturally. And I haven't seen her eating with her left hand the whole week. <laughs> uh, she, you know, she's one with the, the giver. Uh, just like Ruth, you know. She stopped gleaning the field and married the owner of the field. <laughs> Glory to God. Well, that's what it's all about, baby. <laughs> so, so we start responding to his gifts. You know, but, and if we need to get oriented and excited about the gifts, then ask the church to put up with us and tolerate us that we're not nearly as mature as they are. Isn't it amazing how impatient we get with people who are having experiences like we used to have before we got so mature? Yeah. <laughs> I get with some people, you know, and I testify to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you didn't say a thing about, you know, race issue, peace, and war, and economics. I said, I was just given how to break through. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't even have an adequate, uh, you know, uh, view of that yet. The Lord didn't say that if you get an adequate view of, you know, politics, economics, social issues, I'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost. No, but somehow we ought not just sit around looking at the ring forever. We ought to grow and get involved and start manifesting what this means, as we were told yesterday morning. And incidentally, thank you all for this morning's meditation. Beautiful, exquisite. It was like a beautiful pearl being displayed. It was just gorgeous, that meditation this morning. It thrilled my soul. In fact, it's just about what meditation's all about. Uh, it was just wonderful, just great. Uh, I didn't mean to get <laughs> I'll, I'll quit rambling. But uh, this wonderful union with the Lord Jesus 
as the Holy Spirit brings us into union. Jesus, oh, I'll go back to watermelon seed. My granddaddy didn't preach me a great big sermon. He just said, son, now we are going to have watermelon just like the picture on the package. But there are some processes involved between getting those watermelons and right now. And in order to get those melons like the picture, we have to plant the seed. And he showed me how to make a hole and let me plant the seed with him, cover the hole up. Then he said, now, I want you to come back and help me when the vines start growing. And I came back and helped turn vines while he plowed. Then one day he sent me word that there were some watermelons on the vine. And I came back and went out, and lo and behold, they weren't watermelons. Little old cucumbers, I thought. <laughs> I mean, they didn't look like watermelons. Uh, we had the picture on the package, uh, you know, nailed to a stake at the end of the row. And I went back and looked at the picture. <laughs> Granddaddy, that's not, that's not a watermelon. That looks like a cucumber. Son, you're going to have to have faith. You ever meet anybody testified belonging to Jesus? And it sure don't look like the picture on the package. <laughs> look more like a uh, cucumber. <laughs> but, but it's wonderful, you know. And so I just worked with him. And one day, along in late July, I came to see my granddaddy. And there, that patch was just loaded down with watermelons, just like the picture on the package. <laughs> Beloved, now are we the sons of God. It doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So Jesus, coming to live within us, has the patience to live there, and so identify with us, not as the finished product, you see, uh, Jesus, you're the resurrected Lord, you're the new humanity, you're already a saved man, the new order. Come and live within me, take over, none of me, all of you. And what does he do? Dies out like a seed. And seed don't hoop and holler. Hey, pay attention to me, pay attention to me. No, seed just dies. <laughs> I see it just dies out. You have to pay attention to it. That's the way it is with Jesus. Jesus dies out to us. Mind of our mind. Spirit of our spirit. Bone of our bone. Flesh of our flesh. And you get a thought and you say, Jesus, is that you? And he doesn't say, mm -hmm. What do you do? Study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman needs not be ashamed. Who learns to believe that Jesus is in me. Jesus wants to live his life out, not only in me, not only through me, but as me. Now, you remember that, will you? If you forget everything else I said, remember this. Jesus wants to live his life out, resurrected life out, through you, in you, and as you. See, he'd rather be seen as you than to be seen apart from you. That's the glory of the majesty of grace. Man, if you, had, if you had limitless privilege and choice of where you'd like to live and manifest, would you have chosen to live on the inside of me? You know, all of you are beautiful, but I don't think there's a one here pretty enough that I'd choose for my eternal abiding place. But Jesus has. He's chosen me. <laughs> He's chosen you. And wants to be seen as you, Rita. And says, Tommy, in spite of all your pretty theology, it's the way you treat Rita. You see, I won't come along and say, oh, I, the Christ in me sees the Christ in you. I want to tell you that's metaphysical pre-incarnation. It's not just the Christ in me seeing the Christ in you. It's, Rita, I love you. See, I won't come along and say, oh, I, the Christ in me sees the Christ in you. I want to tell you that's metaphysical pre-incarnation. 
It's not just the Christ in me seeing the Christ in you. It's, Rita, I love you. <laughs> you see, Jesus doesn't draw, take a, you know, a divine scalpel and draw over here and say, now, Tommy, over here's me, over there's Rita. Dewey and I, my older brother, used to do that in bed, you know. You ever sleep with your brother or sister? <laughs> you know, just about the time you get the bed warm, here he comes, jumps in bed with his old cold feet, slaps him right on you. Man, I had woke my mama up a hundred. Mama, make Dewey get his old feet off of me. <laughs> and then I'd get up, you know, and I'd draw a line right down that mat. <laughs> uh, you stay over there and I stay over here. <laughs> and, you know, some people want to do Jesus that way. Just like, you know, just like in the incarnation. Over here is acting human. Over here is acting like God. Acting like man. Acting like God. Well, I want to tell you, everywhere you find Jesus, he's acting like God-man and a man-God. <laughs> it's both and and not either or. That's why the church doesn't teach divorce. Now, to any of you who are divorced, I want to tell you God can heal it. He can redeem it. But divorce is not acceptable as an expression of the church. And that's what marriage is, an expression of the church. And Jesus hadn't come uh, on a 50-50. No good marriage is 50-50. A good marriage is 100-100. <laughs> you know, uh, for it's all of you and all of him, all of the time, in every way. And so Jesus gives himself to us in terms of our own individuality, and we dare accept ourselves as those who have been infused and indwelled with Jesus himself. Now, how do we go about manifesting Jesus? He's told us in the scripture I read this morning, through keeping his commandments. We really manifest Jesus in our obedience to him. You need never worry whether anybody else is seeing Jesus or not. More often when you're trying to get them to, they don't. <laughs> Uh, but if you really want to manifest Jesus, you just walk in obedience. Obedience to his word. And his word, incidentally, is written in different places. You know, I, I love our return to a conservative theological position today. But I want to tell you, I deplore legalism. And sometimes I find some of us uh, who are, you know, doing by, doing by the Bible like some folks by gifts. We, we've been so insecure and so out there in the prodigal land that when we start finding the word, we, we somehow, you know, really become legalistic about the Bible. I, you study the Bible. It will tell you that the word of God is written in different places. It will tell you that the word of God is written here in Scripture that holy men of old wrote as they were inspired or led by the Holy Spirit. That this word of God is not given for private inter interpretation. It, it, it really, scripture really teaches you that this is the word of God. But this same scripture also teaches you that in the new order, I will take out the heart of stone. I will put in the heart of flesh. I will write my law and my word in your innermost being. You know, you've got the living word of God written in your inner being. And we need to pay attention to that, too. It's not just standing on the Bible. I mean, it says it here, and if I believe it, that settles it. Now, I want to tell you, there may be a time and there may be places when that's what you're led to do. But that is awfully dangerous because it's acting as if this is the total word God will quicken the word in my heart to the word that he's written here. It's not just the Bible says it, I believe it. The Bible says it, I believe it. But Lord, is this the time and place? Is, am I the one you're speaking it to? And you start listening to the word that's written in your heart. But he said that we are living epistles, didn't he? You are a living epistle. 
spelled out in a language that I can understand. I may not understand the Bible, but I tell you, when I see Calvary love coming through you, I can understand it. <laughs> I can understand your sacrificial service. I can understand your kindness, your benevolence. I can understand your faith. And I need to hear it from the living church. I know God has forgiven me. I know Jesus has died. But I need to hear my brothers and sisters who are living epistles say, Tommy, I find no fault. I forgive you, my brother. I accept God's cleansing blood for you, my brother. I set you free, my brother. Hallelujah. We become that living word one to another. So the word is written in the Bible. The word is written in our hearts. The word is written in our fellow members. Uh, the church. The word is written in history around us. For God is foreordained from the foundation of the world that human history should find its consummation in terms of Jesus. And any person, and this is a part of the prophetic ministry, I, I, I really hope that we'll overcome restricting the ministry of prophecy. And a lot of what I hear is prophecy, a call prophecy, I believe scripturally is exhortation. Don't think it's prophecy at all. I think it's exhortation. Somebody exhorting, and I, and I would hope that the church would rediscover the office of the exhorter. <laughs> Maybe that's what you think you got in preaching. <laughs> uh, but much of what we call prophecy is exhortation. Uh, prophecy, in, in, as I see it in the, especially the scriptural sense, has, is one who has the anointing, the insight, to relate the historical processes to the now. Ties it both in terms of the historical to the moment and brings the judgments of God to bear on the moment in terms of history. It's both that. Uh, the, does that. Does that sort of make sense to you? I think, does that true, is that true in your understanding? So let's pray God will really develop the gift of prophecy within us. And if you want to exhort, exhort all you please. And if it's prophecy, don't, don't, don't let me intimidate you. Prophesy. By goodness, prophesy. I take your liberty in the Lord. But then pray, God, expand this ministry of prophecy. Expand this gift of prophecy. And let me learn to relate and see God's word written in history around me. Now, guidance, as I understand it, is not a blueprint that we figure out. Guidance is not a formula we follow. Guidance is the inevitable result of walking with the guide. That's what guidance is. See, I went around uh, these hills the other day. I just sat back. I enjoyed it. I didn't worry whether we were going to get there or not. I didn't have to ask, where am I now? Are you sure you're going to get there? Is this the right place? Let's stop looking at the mountain. I mean, I just ran back on that front seat. I trusted my God. Now, I, I couldn't prove that I was being guided, but I'd look back and tell you I was because I came home. <laughs> uh, see, and guidance is also a life of faith. Uh, very seldom along the way can you prove to yourself or anyone else that you're actually being guided. But you can know you're walking with the God. And you can know that the one who's called you, one who's come to live within you, has assumed the responsibility for your way, for if you commit your way unto him, he'll direct your path. I don't know exactly where I am along the way, but I know Jesus. I don't see all things under his feet yet, but I see Jesus. And we keep our eyes on Jesus, looking unto him, the author, the perfecter of our faith, and run this race with patience. So, guidance is the inevitable result of walking with the God. But there are some principles involved in terms of understanding. And I'll just say this as quickly as I know how I'm close. Uh, one as uh, the basic aspect of guidance, as I understand it, is getting the balanced view between the various emphases of 
the Word of God. It may come to you first in the Word in your own heart. It may be quickened within you, and you think, am I supposed to do that? Does the Lord really want me to get into fashions and design? Uh, why should the Lord let me get worldly like that? Why can't I do something noble like being a nun? <laughs> you know, uh, why, why, why should I be interested in fashions? That must not be the Lord. If it was the Lord, I wouldn't want it. The very fact that I desire it means God doesn't want me to have it. Man, how often have we felt that way? But as children of God, pay attention to the desires of your heart. When you pray, whatsoever you don't want, be afraid that God might give it to you, and you shall get it. <laughs> no. When you pray, whatsoever you desire. See, study the desires of your heart. Listen to the word. Lord, I'm willing to live with that. Now, sometimes when the word comes, we get, it, we get afraid. Oh, I, I better do it right now. Because if I don't, it's going to go away. The word of God is undefiled. The word of God is immutable. The word of God fadeth not away. The word of God is eternal. The word of God is life. And when God speaks, you need to be afraid it's going to die out on you. If it dies out, it'll, if it was the Lord, it'll come back in a reinforced way. So, Lord, I'm willing to live with that word. And if that's you, let it grow within me. Let it grow. And you start living. And often when the word is quickened from within you, it's in terms of a dream of the heart. You don't have to run out and blab it right off. Sometimes the word, like a seed, has to come to a level of maturity before it's released or planted. And this is one little danger I find with some of the prayers of confession. Oh, look, will you agree with me right now? Confess, confess. It's not that that's not true. It's not that it's not basic. It's that it's premature. It's like planting your roast nears. <laughs> roast nears are wonderful to eat, but they won't do for planting. And uh, often this word of God that's quickened in our hearts is not for planting. It's for mulling around. <laughs> it's for feeding on. It's for paying attention to and living with. And Lord, let it grow. But then, Lord, let it be affirmed and confirmed. Let me hear you saying it in other ways. You see, it's not the impetuous word that we obey. It's the confirm word. It's the confirm word. And as the word is quickened within, uh, and, and you come to uh, one way to ask about concerning the word from within. Are you at home with that word when you're at your best? As, as a child of God, can you see yourself doing that which you see in your heart? Would you have to apologize to the saints you know for doing what you're doing? Or would you be willing for Jesus to come back and find you putting the cross on the mantle? <laughs> I thought that was so beautiful last night. I said, uh, you can ask yourself, am I at home? Would I be at home if this was made manifest? If people around me knew what I was thinking, would I have to defend? Would I apologize? Would I be ashamed? Or am I willing to gladly be identified with this word in my heart? See, the word of God brings life. My joy. These words have I spoken to you that my joy might be in you and that your joy might be full. Glory to God. Let him give you all the joy he wants to. <laughs> My joy is to do the will of him that sent me. Will of God ought to excite you a little bit. So you pay attention. But then you say, all right, Lord, I, this is your word too. So as I read your word today, I thank you, Jesus, for letting your written word, your scriptures, be a means of helping to understand your quickened word in my own heart. And you, you, you begin to see in terms of one another. His word here, his word here. But it doesn't stop there. If you're going to learn to walk in obedience to the Lord, you need members of the body to walk with because they are valid 
expressions of the Word of God. So, you, 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 you move with the members of the body to whom you're given. That may be just two or three. I hope you, I hope you have a pastor that really, you know, you feel at home with and know that he understands you as a person, and loves you, and knows something about the realm of the Spirit. I hope you have a prayer group, a working prayer group. Yeah, really, this is what CFO is all about, not just to have prayer groups in the afternoon, but to show us how wonderful it is to be a part of a close-knit praying and studying and, you know, ministering group. And, and really, if you, if you don't know anybody to start with, just say, Jesus, I'd love so much to have a prayer group. You know how many it takes to make a prayer group? Just two. Where two or three gathered in my name, there I'll be in the midst of them. Uh, Lord, bring them to me, the right one, right time. And you don't have to advertise. Tommy Tyson wants a prayer partner. <laughs> Call this number. No, Jesus, I need a member of your body to pray with and walk with and grow with. You know who it is. You know who they are. Let me get identified with them. And it's amazing. It might be the very ones that you're wondering how long you're going to have to put up with them. <laughs> Uh, you know, if you are in a prayer group, inevitably there's somebody in that prayer group that you're wondering how they got there. <laughs> and how long it's going to discover, for, uh, take them to discover they're not supposed to be there. And you know, to somebody in that group, you're the person. <laughs> <laughs> it's just wonderful. So we start paying attention and we start checking it out. And then we look at circumstances around us. The history. Lord, I see your hand here. And we began to move step by. But then it comes down to the responsibility of your redeemed will. It comes down to the responsibility of your redeemed will. Just like in marriage, you could have said, Lord, I love him to pieces. I'm excited about the thought of him coming to see me or whatever else, bringing the ring or flowers or whatever. But Lord, I'm not quite sure he's the one I'm supposed to marry. Lord, I, he loves me. You know, we've prayed about it. It seems right. Our families are in favor of it. Everybody seems to think it's just ordained of God. But Lord, I'm not quite sure. Now, if you just make me sure so I'll know it, and I'll know it, and I'll know it. I'll marry him. Well, who wouldn't? <laughs> no faith involved in that. Not a bit of faith in that. Lord, if you spread it up, so I can just see it like, you know, writing in the sky, I'll do it. No, you wouldn't. <laughs> you'd go around and say, look, look, and you'd let your doctrine about the writing be a substitute for obedience. So the Lord brings a divine solicitation that brings you up out of yourself. Lord, I see the possibility there might be another girl that make him a better wife. I don't know who she is. And I think there might be a possibility of somebody making me a better husband. And I, but I haven't met them. So i tell you what I'm going to do, Jesus. I'm going to take Doug as a gift from your hand. And I'm going to take this step of faith. And Lord, it's not just a step to the altar. It's a way of life. And you know, if we, if we noticed, I, I'm keeping you over just a little bit. Sister, will you forgive me? <laughs> but have you noticed the marriage ceremony? When, when the bride comes down, there stands the bridegroom and the best man and the pastor and the father, whoever, is giving the bride away. And the pastor comes to the place of saying, who gives this woman to be married to this man? And he either says, you know, usually I do or her mother and I, whatever. That father doesn't give that girl to that boy. There's not a daddy worth his salt that ever thought there was a hair-headed boy good enough for his daughter. And God doesn't ask him to do it. 
Do you know what that father does? He puts that daughter's hand in the pastor's hand. That pastor is standing in the name of Jesus. That pastor is saying, in effect, I have talked and prayed and gone before the Lord concerning this couple, and I'm agreeing with them in faith that this marriage is to be attended by the Holy Spirit, and it's to be an outward and visible expression of the church. And I accept this daughter as a daughter of the church. And in the name of Jesus, I give her to the man. And in the name of Jesus, I give him to the bride. And you accepted him. It said, for better, for worse. <laughs> that may, means when he feels good, and that means when he's moody. And that means when she's happy, Doug, that means when she's negative. That means when she thinks you when she thinks you're the greatest, and that means when she thinks you're the sloppiest. <laughs> you know, a boy. For that Lord, you mean that's a good gift? <laughs> a good and perfect gift. Now I want to ask you husbands and wives right here this morning, while I'm talking, to reaffirm in your own heart that my husband is God's gift to me, and I'll treat him like it. My wife is God's gift to me, and I'll treat her like it. I didn't mean to get on this, but I'm going to go ahead and follow through. Because Frances was my high school sweetheart. The first time I ever saw her, I knew I was going to marry her. I told my brother the next day. I was 12. <laughs> and I told my brother the next day, I'm going to marry that girl. I saw her in a church play. Two years, yeah, she was 10. Uh, and two years later, we moved to her hometown. There was one, Francis' girlfriend said about me and Dewey, my oldest brother, and I, I'll take the black-headed one. And Francis said, the curly-headed one's mine. <laughs> and she didn't know it, but she was mine. Now, all through high school, she was my sweetheart in college. She finished college one week. We married the next. And after I married her, I didn't know what to do with her. <laughs> you see I hadn't, mar I hadn't married a person. I had married a dream. I had married idealism. I had married romantic concept. That's who I'd married. I hadn't married a real human being. I had wrapped all my idealism up in that little girl. And I thought everything God ever wanted any woman to be, he had put in her, and she could do no wrong. She could act no wrong. She could speak no wrong. Now, that's wonderful in courtship, but boy, it's hell when you marry. <laughs> and you know, sometimes we do the Lord that way. We, we idolize the Lord. Nowhere does the scripture tell us to idolize the Lord. He becomes an idol until we marry him. And we find out we're dealing with a person. <laughs> and have to learn to live in the harness with. And so the Lord... It took me several years to begin to f discover what was happening. And, you know, after, I, well, in fact, I, many different experiences. I'll just tell you a couple. One night, I, you know, Francis didn't know how to minister to me. You know, had a headache. Lord, help headaches. <laughs> Made me so mad. I got out of bed and I went to my study and I said, Lord, if I had the courage of a decent man, I'd find me somebody that loved me. You know, my minute too. And the Lord, you know, I don't know that he whispered, but this thought came up from within. You're treating her as if she's your own property. Didn't you remember that I was the one that gave her to you? And she's a gift from me. And my first thought was, and you can have her. <laughs> uh, but, but you know, he began to teach me. Now, son, that wasn't just for that occasion. That was for a way of life. It's day by day. Give us this day our daily bread. Means you're looking to Jesus in all aspects of life in an existential relationship. Hallelujah. That means right here, right now. Ha, 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 ha.
God. You, know, you look into Jesus. And he said, you're having a problem because you're not trusting me. And I repented. And I said, Jesus, by your grace, I'll look to you to minister to me through my Francis. And when it comes to the time that she doesn't know how to do it, it's going to be your problem and not mine. And I'm going to tell you about it, and I won't fuss with her about it. And I can't tell you the miracle that's happened in Francis. <laughs> <laughs> now, one, one, one other aspect is this. Because I loved, I, and I have loved, and I love her more now in a different way than I ever have. Uh, I love her so much that I'm willing for her to be herself. And that takes a death on my part. <laughs> Quite often. <laughs> but it's wonderful to know that. But anyway, I never felt adequate as her husband. Uh, when, that's why when bills would come in and I didn't have enough money, I didn't, never felt that I was able to, to provide her with what she needed not to have. And when bills came in and I couldn't pay them, then what do you do? Fall down on your knees and say, Lord, I'm sorry I'm such a sore, poor, uh, sore, uh, poor provider? Or do you blame your wife for being a spendthrift? Well, if you don't know how to pray, you blame. <laughs> and I've done a lot of both. But in sex, I felt so inadequate. Now, we, we've enjoyed our sex life all the way through, but I've often wondered, does Frances really wish she'd married somebody else sexually? And I live with that question because I didn't think I was too good a lover, you know, didn't know how to be a husband much, just sort of did the best I could. And one night, I was, you know, feeling that way and wishing... You know, that somehow I knew more and could love better. And this memory of that night where the Lord taught me to accept Francis as a good and perfect gift came back to me. Now, son, you're learning to take her from my hand. She's my gift to you. She's a good and perfect gift. But, son, it wasn't a one-sided wedding, and it's not. I gave you to her. And I give good and perfect gifts. And you are exactly the one that I'm choosing to give to her. There's not another man in the universe that I'm giving to her as her husband. You're my choice. Because you have accepted that relationship in faith. Now I'll make you a good and perfect gift. Man, did my whole manhood just come to the surface. <laughs> And I want to tell you from that night to this, I don't worry. I just rejoice that Francis has me. <laughs> I glory. <laughs> I, I in you and thou in me. Now, in that relationship you begin to discover that you don't have to fight with life. We have growing pains. We have struggles in faith, but we don't fight with life. We respond to it. And we respond to it from the inside out. For life has changed its movement. You see, pre-incarnation, life moves from outside in. Pre-incarnation is from outside in, outward stimuli. Incarnation is from, down, from up down. That's incarnation. In the Pentecostal relationship, that's now. That's the church. It's not from outside, merely from outside in or from da up down. It's from inside out. Out of your belly, innermost being, will flow rivers of life, liver, liver, living water. The issues of life flow out of you. And we learn to live it and learn to manifest it in terms of abandonment to Jesus. Seeing him everywhere. In the morning, I see his face. In the evening, his form I trace. In the evening, his voice I know. I see Jesus everywhere I go. Hallelujah.